Well, I invite you to open up your Bibles, if you have one, to Luke chapter 14. Now, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Luke is the third one. And I invite you to open up to chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, you feel free to use the one in front of you. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If you don't have a Bible at your house, you feel free to take the one that's in front of you. We'll replace it. We want you to be able to have God's Word to be able to read throughout the week. Uh, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. There's a short story, I don't know if you've read it, called Babette's Feast. It was turned into a movie in the 1980s. And uh, the story is kind of, the, the central focus of the story is a lavish meal that's going to be prepared for this small gathering individuals. At the center of those individuals are two sisters. These sisters are part of a basically dying religious sect. Their father had been the pastor of. He had passed away. It was an ascetic group. In other words, they, they, they sought to live a pious life by not letting themselves enjoy any pleasure. And so that's the way the sisters were living one day, this poor French woman appears and asks, can she be their servant? They can't pay her, but they say, you'll be able to stay here at our little kind of religious uh, commune here and, and take and be the servant, the maid, the, the cook. And indeed, she does. Well, Babette uh, wins the French lottery. And they don't realize that she did and that instead of taking that money and going back to France and having a life for herself, she decides that she is going to take all of it and order special ingredients from all over the world to be able to provide such an incredible, lavish meal for these two sisters. For them, but for these sisters. That, that they would, you know, these, these, that they would just so, you know, they don't realize she's using all of her money, that they would so be able to enjoy it. As it's unfolding, you realize the intentions of the sisters are this, that they're going to endure the meal and do everything they can not to experience any pleasure or express any pleasure in it. A few minutes, we're going to share the Lord's table. By the grace of God, what I want to share over the next few minutes, by the grace of God, will make it impossible for you <laughs> to not enjoy a delight in your soul when you eat this table. May it be that nobody in this room, in a few minutes, just has a tasteless piece of bread and a few sips of some crushed grapes, right? May it be, by the grace of God, that when we share this in a moment, that there be none of us here who don't enjoy it in the depth of our soul. I want to begin by looking at a passage of scripture that will first look at the invitation that Jesus gives us, right? The invitation to each and every one. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus shares a story, a parable, but it's a story with a purpose, a teaching. And we read in verse 16 of Luke 14, but he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. First one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported to this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there's room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. 
We're reading about a meal, right? We read in verse 17, at the dinner hour, he said, go tell them, come, everything is ready. Matthew shares the same story in his gospel. He gives a little more detail. We've prepared all the food. There's, in other words, there's been a lot of preparation intentionally for this meal. Everything is ready. The, the host is anticipating feeding people. Anticipating blessing them when they come to his table, his banquet. He isn't surprised. This isn't you know, you know, something that he hadn't planned. When we were grew up on Spruce Avenue, when I was a, a kid, and we we in our kitchen there, you know, every night. Usually, it was the the same eight of us around the table, my mom and dad, and the six of us sitting there. And <clears throat> I can remember on one particular evening at the time, we kind of had a a, a, a unique uh, maverick pastor who had come into the town across the street and he wasn't here that long and but um he was a bit peculiar and and kind of uh self uh exalting and and i remember we're sitting down to eat and the phone rings and he basically said to my mom okay i'm coming to your house for dinner tonight set another plate for me and so I, she did, I remember, and us kind of be like, what? what's he doing coming here, right? We, we didn't invite him, right? He invited himself, right? You know, and, and, and made, room was made, right? There's, there's no, that's no part of the picture here. There's no sense of, what? Wait, I heard, what? I want to come. No, the invitation goes out, the master has a banquet planned, and it is a meal prepared and there are those who are invited who reject it. And the house owner, the host says, send the message out to all. Now, in one sense, this parable, we see the, the one aspect of the fulfillment. If you look over at John's gospel, John chapter one, for in John chapter one, when we read about the Lord Jesus, when we read about the Lord Jesus coming to the earth, right? And presenting himself as the Messiah. What do we read in John chapter 1 and verse 10? We read, he was in the world and the world was made through him and yet the world did not know him. Verse 11, he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. In other words, there were many of the Jews who were his national brothers and sisters. He was coming to be the Messiah who just said no. We reject you. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. In other words, we've seen that in one sense, that parable, the invitation to a banquet. In one sense, we've seen it fulfilled one life at a time. As one life at a time response because there are those who rejected the invitation but the invitation goes out to all to everyone go out into the highways and byways compel them to come in and the invitation to the meal and in one real sense we see that fulfilled each time somebody responds to the gospel and they become a child of God and get a place at the table The fact also is, I believe the invitation in that parable is still pointing to a future feast. A future feast that is going to occur. And the invitation to any and all guests who will respond through the years to be part of that banqueting table. There's a second thing I want us to see, and it's a meal to remember. Before that future feast, there was, of course, the meal to remember, right? As Jesus was coming to the close of his earthly ministry, as he was getting to the point of fulfilling why he came, because why did he come? There are people today, there are atheists today, who absolutely know Jesus Christ of Nazareth walked this earth. They know that. 
they, they, they see the, they, they, they see the historical, uh, references, not only in scripture, but outside of scripture. And they, they don't question whether he walked the earth. They question who he was. And they want to shape who he was. He says, I'll tell you who I am. And he said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life a ransom. I came as the son of God to pay a ransom price for the sins of mankind. He's about to do that when he does what? He invites a particular group of his followers to a meal. If you look at Luke chapter 22, you'll see that meal. It's a meal that a particular group of his followers are invited to, but we certainly know it is a meal for all of us to remember. And it gives us some real insight into what it means to be a guest of Jesus at his banqueting table. We weren't at that one. But we celebrate it. We remember it. Because of the insight it gives us into who they were, who we are, and what it really means to be a guest of Jesus. For in Luke chapter 22, if you look at verse 14, what do we read? When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. He lets them know what they're about to share together. When we read this passage, a couple things do stand out at this meal to remember. And the first thing is this. When you're a guest of Jesus, it isn't Vince plus one. It's Vince plus Greta plus Natalie plus whoever you are, right? I don't mean I'm first on the invitation. I, that, that came out wrong. I meant that it's personal. It's who you are. You're not just, I'm not sure who they're bringing, you know? I invited so and so and I'm not sure who they're bringing. No. The invitation is personal. And when you get to the meal, It's personal. He knows who he invited. He knows who's at his table. He knows you. And and he says it right there, right? He says in verse 15, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. I with you, right? It, It is such a personal thing. John and his passage of scripture he writes to help us see how personal it is he adds what he tells us when they arrive there before they're sitting you know and eating the meal when they arrive there as guests what does john tell us well if you look at john chapter 13 just a few uh, pages over john makes it clear In verse 3, John says in John chapter 13 and verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. And he said to him, do you wa- Lord, do you wash my feet? It's Peter to Jesus, right? Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And he does, and the story shares that he washed all of their feet around the table. 
I want you to think about that, right? Because it's personal. As Jesus looks around the table, and imagine yourself there, eventually, he looks at you. He looks at you. He's looking at your eyes. I don't know what you would do. Some of you might go, I don't like when somebody looks at me, right? Some of you might, me, right? I, I don't know what you'd do, but he looks at you. And then he comes to each and every one of them. He comes to each and every one of them and takes hold of their feet. I forget which one of your children it was, but several years ago, we were standing together. I, I, I think it was up here after a service, but I, I don't, you know, I don't remember everything. But, <laughs> but, but I just, I, I remember this. I remember one of your little ones coming up, and I'm standing with you, and they came up and without really attention thought I was one of you, and they took my hand. And I was like, oh. And you were kind of like, wow. And as I'm standing there with them and they realize they caught sight of you, they looked up at me and I'll remember, I remember the response. <laughs> right? It was kind of like, right? and, and they moved away, right? I remember it clearly me like, I, I didn't know how to like, uh, to, to, you know, I, it's like walking in a room and somebody has earphones on. How do I not scare them? Right. I didn't know. And I want you to know. When you're at the banqueting table, when Jesus gets to you and takes your feet, he's not going to go, and so, you know, ah, I didn't mean yours. <sighs> it's not going to happen. Some of you think it. I don't, you, we sing, how can I say thanks? And, and I'm singing it like, this is so amazing. And you're singing it like, I, I, I don't know how to say thanks because I'm sure it's a mistake. I'm sure that somehow he, 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 you know, he, he, he somehow when, when that day comes, he's going to say to me, no, I didn't mean you. But that's not true. The fact is, he is going to come to your seat. And he's going to kneel down. And he's going to take your feet into his hands. And he's going to look into your eyes. And he's going to wipe off your dirt. And he's going to say, you're my guest. You're my guest. Is that stunning? It is so personal to be a guest of Jesus. But he invites you to be. And maybe you know you already are, but maybe you're sitting here right now and saying, I don't know if I am. He invites you to. It is so personal, but it's also so costly. Because what does... Jesus say to the disciples, and maybe you're a visitor and you're going, okay, here, that's what I was waiting for, the costly, okay. My friends told me about this. He's going to, what do I got to give? Jesus says this, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends. In other words, Jesus is saying, I want you to know how much it costs for you to be here. I want you to know how much I'm paying for you to be here at this table. And that's what he says in, in Luke's gospel there, chapter 22, right? We read those verses in verse 19. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, The cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It's my blood that's being poured out for you. For you. 
for Mother Teresa who reached down and hugged all those sick individuals? Yes. And for Vincent McDonald who threw a rock through somebody's window on Alexander Avenue 40 years ago. If it was you, I, I still owe you, so I'll rectify that. If, if it was your house. If... I share it. I, I, mean, I, just, I don't mean it like, oh, humble me. I just mean it's, that's real. That's, I, I, that's, I, 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 we're sinners. We fail. And you're welcome to be disappointed with me that I threw a rock through somebody's window. Because I was disappointed with me. But Jesus knew I was going to do it when he invited me to the meal. It's the dirt that he washed off my feet. And worse. It's costly. See, Jesus says, I paid it for you. There are no cheap seats at the table. Those of you who remember, we used to get into general admission at Vet Stadium. And then the whole reason for being there was to see how much you could get down further. The usher's looking away. You get down a little lower. Think we can make it down another section? Let's try, right? There are no cheap seats at the table. This meal that we remember was for a particular few. But it's remembered by many more. Than those who were there, right? We see that thirdly because we realize there's a lot more invitations that have gone out since that meal. Jesus left the table. If you want to turn to John chapter 17, he left the table and he went to the garden to pray because he knew what was about to come. And in the garden of Gethsemane, as he's praying alone to his father, he says in John chapter 17 and verse 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He's praying. And he's certainly praying for those particular ones he had at the table. Because what do we read at verse 6? I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. But that's not all he's praying for. Because if you keep going in the prayer and you look at verse 20. Jesus says to his father. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. But for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are one in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. In other words, remember this, when that meal to remember was shared with those particular group of people. None of Jesus' followers yet were speaking Chinese or German or French or Spanish or English. Those invitations were still on their way. My invitation arrived in 1975 when I, in my soul, realized that Jesus was saying to me, Vincent, I want you at my table. I poured out my blood for you. Your invitation may be sitting in your hands right now. But what an invitation. There's a lot more than just that sampling, right? A week and a half ago when uh, Pastor Greg was ministering to his family and sharing at the funeral... For his 19 year old nephew who uh, had died. And I arrived there in Jim Thorpe, PA, 
a couple hours before, you know, sometimes when you're going up there and everything's determined by the Schuylkill. You know that. So how, how can I beat the Schuylkill and get up there before or whatever? And so I got up there in the area and I thought, you know what, uh, I'll go study somewhere. And I saw some signs for a memorial field in Jim Thorpe, PA. I don't think I've ever been in Jim. I may have driven through it or whatever, but I don't think I was ever in Jim Thorpe, PA before. And um, so I went to this memorial field, baseball fields there, and, you know, some picnic tables. I'm like, great, this is exactly where I need to be. You know, there were some bathrooms, there was basketball courts. And I was dressed kind of like this. I had black pants on, but a white shirt and tie. I, I didn't have my jet, black jacket on. But I, as I'm walking, I sat my books on a picnic table, and I started walking to the bathroom. As I'm walking to the bathroom, this teenager carrying a basketball walking by me. And he goes... Wow, mister, you really look terrific today. <laughs> Man, these people are friendly here at Jim Thorpe PM. <laughs> now, if you weren't offended by my throwing a rock, you may be offended by why sh- I share next, but, but hopefully not. I went into the bathroom uh, and stepped up to the urinal. So, and as I was standing there, I reached to flush, and as I did, water came shooting out at me, and as I jumped back, and it hit my pants there, and I didn't ask you if I could share that, Gret, and you may be thinking, why would he tell everybody that, right? Here's my point, all right? How did this fit in? What happened to the Lord's table, and he's mentioning urinals? Oh, my goodness, right? My point is, I was alone in the bathroom, and I said out loud, well, I guess I've just seen the best and the worst of Jim Thorpe, PA, right? The people are friendly. The urinals are lousy here, right? You know, what's a... But I realize it was just a sampling, right? Maybe some of the people are not friendly. And maybe some of the urinals work well, right? It'll be the last time I reference that. Jesus says, when you look at the Lord's table, you're just seeing a sampling of people there. Yes, they're the disciples that I called, that particular group. But if you think the invitation that I, when I was talking about that there's a feast to be enjoyed, if you think that feast was just for them, you're just... Seeing a sampling of what? Of the meal to celebrate. The meal that is yet to come to celebrate. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. See, the meal to remember was prior to his redemption. The meal to celebrate is after. It's victory. Right? It's a victory. For what do we read in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 4? We read this, and the 24 elders, Revelation 19 and verse 4, the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. You're going to, we're going to hear something quite interesting about that in just a moment, right? Verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready and it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. See, this meal, when we read in verse 4 about the 24 elders, and you may have a study Bible, and it may say, well, we think it's this, or we think it's that. And the reality is, there are 
numerous, I think, I think Chuck Swindoll said there's 11 different views he's read of who the 24 elders are, right? Uh, you know, some people, well, they're the 12 tribes of Israel and they're the 12 apostles representing the, but yeah, most agree that they seem to be a group that is representing the entire redeemed of the Lord. We, we, we are introduced to them earlier in Revelation. If you want to turn to Revelation chapter 4. For in Revelation chapter 4 when we're seeing this incredible throne room in heaven. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 4 we read around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. We read about the redeemed of the Lord. We read, read the white, white garments, right? In chapter 5 and verse 8, what do we read? When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. See, it's like the 24 elders are somehow representing, you know, the, 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 full, the full body of the redeemed of the Lord Matter of fact, in verse 9 of Revelation chapter 5, we get a little more description of, of this, this, this group that's there, right? In verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. In other words, sitting here at this table, sitting at this meal that we're reading out, this hallelujah, this amazing truth, here we're looking at this meal to celebrate, this meal that we have been invited to, this meal that has been prepared for all the redeemed of the Lord to come be celebrating with our Savior Jesus. And when John Here's these words, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's an amazing thing happening here. Because John is looking at it and saying, wow, look at what these people are getting. But there's something fascinating going on. Because John is part of these people. In other words, John is hearing about a meal that he's at. He's, he's seeing, if he's seeing a vision, a table. And, and, and that's almost like John's going, and I saw this. And wait a minute. That guy looks like me. Right? This sense of what, the, the vision that's unfolding, the table that's before him, the marriage supper of the lamb. He's at it. A couple, I don't know, a couple of years, summers ago, Gary Horvath took me to a Eagles preseason game, and I knew that we were going to be sitting right behind the goalposts. And you know, every time they take an extra point, you know, you get to see those who are sitting right behind the goalposts initially. And so I taped the game. I wouldn't normally tape a preseason game. I taped the game. After the game, I got home, and I made sure, you know. That after the game, I got home, and I'm watching. Lines up for an extra point. Hit pause. There I am. The goalpost, Gary too, and others, but th there's me, right? I'm in the group, right? I have it as a, I, as a picture, right? You know? Imagine I got to watch the video before the game. Yeah, there I am under the goalpost. That's going to be cool. And then I go to the game, and there I am. I mean, that's, that's really what John is experiencing. John is saying, I'm hearing these voices and I'm seeing this incredible meal. And I'm there. I'm in it. I'm at the table. It's so amazing. I almost think, and I know I can't speak for angels, but I almost think it's so hard to believe that the angel says, no, honest, this is true. Because, right, what does it say there? John says in verse 9, Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb of God. And John says, 
this is me. This is just too hard to believe. And he said to me, these are true words of God. I'm not making it up. Yeah, that is you. And may I say something that just, just, just uh, to fully about what we're share, going to share. If you've been born again, it's you too. You're in there. You're going, wait, 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 I can't, can't see. You know, how do you get it to enlarge? You're in there. You're in the picture. And that's what I was saying. I heard something like the voice of a great multitude. He's hearing you if you're a child of God. He has this vision and he's hearing us singing and proclaiming hallelujah. We're watching the video before we ever experience it. Hallelujah for the Lord our God the Almighty reigns. We're in it. I got to see the Cinderella play that some of you were in, you know, a week or so ago. And uh, Keith and I went to the matinee performance. The matinee is always different because it's got a whole bunch of kids in there. And so if Cinderella kisses somebody, there's ew, that kind of thing, you know. And um, But I had a little kid behind me. And boy, I, he made it. It was wonderful. Don't miss him. He added to it. You know, he added to it. Because he's behind me. And at one point, uh, the prince, who has already met Cinderella somewhere before, but didn't, you know... He, and he's with her now and he says, I feel like I've already met you before. And I hear behind me, yeah, that's because you have, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, you know, the wicked or the mean stepmother or whatever later is kind of scolding her daughters that she's so disappointed with and saying, you know, how she had raised them. And she says, I was doing so well. And he goes, yeah, you were doing so worse. You know, and it was just, I literally turned around at one point and I kind of just said, high five, man. Good, you're doing a good job. Like, right? Oh, he wanted to be, he wanted to be up there, right? He's watching a play, but everything about him is, I want to get in it, right? I want to, I want to be part of it. You're in it if you're a child of God. See, what we're reading here is that we're not reading about other people. If you're a child of God, we're reading about us. We are reading about a meal that we are going to be at. We are reading a sound of a multitude, and part of that sound is me. We are reading about people around the table who are blessed, and it's us. Why? Because he paid our way. In Revelation chapter 5, that's what we read, right? Verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth because he paid our way. There are no cheap seats. He paid our way. He paid our way. I want to ask you as we're about to share this communion, are you at the table in Revelation 19? Are you there? Because if you're not, you're holding the invitation in your hand right now. The invitation is in your hand. Will you Turn to Jesus Christ and say, I am putting all my faith in the fact that you purchased my salvation. I will turn to you as my one and only Savior. I have no chance of being at the table unless I come through you. Will you do that? God wants you at the table. The God who is holding the world in space right now wants you at the table. Are you going to toss the, the invitation away? Let's bow before the Lord as we prepare to take this. Dear friend, you can be at the table. As we bow before God, he says to you, unless you were born again, you will never see the kingdom of heaven.
The wages of your sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father but by me. And so the invitation is in your hand. Will you turn right now and pray in your own heart? You don't have to pray out loud. Oh God, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, oh God, for sending your son to die in my place. I confess my sin now. I put all my faith in Jesus. Save me. Put me at your table. Won't you pray that to God? I confess my sin. I put all my faith in Jesus. Place me at your table. How can I say thanks, O God, for the things that you have done for us? The church's one and only foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. For Lord, with your own blood, you bought us. And for our lives, you died. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.